بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله على محمد وآله الطاهرين اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد Respected brothers and sisters السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته and welcome to our 20th session of our class the philosophy of ethics الأخلاق the next vice that we will speak about today which stems from the previous vice of impatience is the vice of anger the vice of anger called in arabic al ghadab now what is the definition of anger it's a very obvious feeling that we don't really need to define we've all felt it sometimes on a daily basis but if we wanted to put it in words it's a feeling of annoyance irritation rage inside us now anger as you have learned from last year's classes is not always a vice in fact we mentioned last year that anger is one of the four powers of the soul do you remember that we said the four has the soul has four powers one of those powers which is a positive many times power is the power of anger anger has led to revolutions because people are angry at their um, oppressive government it had it had it has led them to uh, you know revolt and uprise which is a good thing and we mentioned this last year and this was was even on the test last year's test one of, one of the benefits of anger is that it helps you when you're attacked it helps you in protecting yourself and your family it also helps you after you commit a crime, after a, you commit a sin or you fail, you're angered at yourself and that motivates you to change. I'm angry. Why am I, you know, always doing haram? Why am I always failing? Why am I not doing what I'm supposed to do? That anger could fuel good things. It could motivate you to change. So anger is not always a vice. When does anger become a vice? When it becomes excessive. Too much anger is dangerous. When you can't control and manage that anger inside you and it turns into an outburst, this is when it's considered as a vice. In a hadith narrated from Imam al-Sadiq salam, he says, غضب, لم يخرجه غضبه من حق. He says when a believer is angered, so even a believer is angered, nothing wrong with that, but he says he knows how to control his anger. His anger doesn't lead him away from the truth, committing crimes, committing haram, yelling, screaming, insulting people. This is the problem. This is the vice, not the anger itself. So a believer knows how to direct his anger in a healthy and correct way. We're not saying a believer is the one that suppresses his anger. He releases it, but in a healthy way, in the right way, in a way in which he does not displease the Almighty Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now, we're also told by Ahlul Bayt alayhim salam that if you're angry for Allah, for the sake of Allah, this is also positive anger. For example, you see someone sinning and you're angered. You see someone is oppressed. You see in the news that Muslims are being killed. For example, in Palestine, in Pakistan, in Burma, in uh, uh, Kashmir and uh, Yemen this angers you right this is a good anger because like we said it can motivate you to try to change to help those individuals so being angry for Allah is good and the hadith tells us Rasulullah would get angered if he saw someone commits a crime commits a sin commits tyranny oppression he would get angry Amir al muminin would get angry but for Allah not for myself because someone took a hat from me but for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the opposing virtue is called forbearance. So we have anger. The opposite, the opposite of anger is forbearance. And, there's, and remember we said that forbearance is a type of patience. Because when you're angry, you have to be patient. You have to remember we said patience is learning to accept and tolerate hardships, annoying things, irritation. So when you can tolerate it and accept it, this is called forbearance. And there's two levels of forbearance, brothers and sisters. The first level is managing. Managing the anger that's inside you. So you're angry, you're burning inside. 
but you have forbearance, meaning you can control it. You can cool yourself down. This in Alm al-Akhlaq is called at-tahallum or kadm al ghayd When there is ghayd, anger inside you, you control it. This is called kadm al ghayd or at-tahallum. That's the first level. And then there's a higher level. The higher level of forbearance is called al-hilm. And that's when you are able to prevent yourself from getting angry for personal things. Someone insults me, right? Someone comes and he cuts in front of me. Many times we're angered. The first level of virtue is to control it. Say, it's okay, it's not a big deal. So you're burning inside, but you don't you know, release it in a crazy way. That's good. A higher level is you practice patience and you practice forbearance until you're no longer angered when someone cuts in front of you. Because you teach yourself this dunya is worthless, who cares? Or whatever for the treatment level that we will reach. This is the highest level of virtue when it comes to controlling anger. Because this is real hilm inside you. You're calm inside. Even your heart is at peace. So when the first level of learning how to manage your temper and controlling it turns into a disposition, a malaka, such that you're not easily provoked, this is what is called hilm. When we read the history of Ahlul Bayt, they set examples of both for us, of hilm and tahallum. Let me give you an example of tahallum. It's narrated that <clears throat> Al-Imam Al-Kadhim Now this story has been attributed to Al-Imam Al-Kadhim, the seventh Imam, and Al-Imam Zain al -Abidin. Now maybe it happened to both of them, or maybe it's one of them, but it's incorrectly attributed to both of them. So the hadith says that Imam al-Kadhim was sitting. He told his slave, he had a slave, to bring food. The slave brought food on a hot plate. It was hot food, hot plate. Because the, because the slave was in a hurry, he rushed. He spilled the food on the imam and burned the imam. Now this obviously would fuel anger, right? If anybody does that to anyone else, your first reaction is anger. Especially if that person was clumsy, was acting clumsy. So the hadith says, the imam was burned, فَغَضِبَ imam. The imam was angered. So there was anger inside him. But then the, the servant or the slave said, he read a verse in the Qur'an. He said, وَالْكَاظِمِينَ الْغَيْضِ The Qur'an says, the Qur'an praises those that control their anger. So the imam said, قَالَ كَظِمْتُ غَيْضِي I have controlled my anger. And then the servant said, وَالْعَافِينَ عَنِ النَّاسِ Go a step further and not only just don't show your anger, control it, but forgive the person that you know, caused the anger. So the imam said, قَالَ قَدْ عَفَوْتُ I have forgiven you. I no longer hold a grudge. And then the verse says, the highest level, وَاللَّهُ يُحِبُّ الْمُحْسَنِينَ Allah loves those that do good, are kind with those that what? That oppress you. This is the highest level. Someone angers you, you do kindness to them. The Imam said, He was a slave, he freed him. That you angered me, you spilled food on me, but I what? I compensated you. Not only did I not seek retribution and I didn't hurt you, but I freed you. And he gave him a gift, a piece of land that the Imam had. Allah. So this is an example of a tahallum. The Imam was angry, but he was able to manage his anger. To control his anger. And then the Imams of Ahlul Bayt السلام, give us examples of Al-Hilm, which is the higher level, where they're not even provoked, they're at peace. And this is a story that is mentioned about Al Imam Al Baqir. The hadith says a man, a Christian man, came to Al Imam Al Sadiq. I'm sorry, to Al Imam Al Baqir. Now, the name of Al Imam Al Baqir, Al Baqir, stems from the word Baqara. In Arabic, Baqar has two meanings. The first is cow. Cows are called Baqar. There's another meaning to Baqar. Baqara is an act. It means when you rip something, when you shed something, right? Al-Imam al-Baqar was called the Baqar. His name was Muhammad, but this was a title given to him by Rasulullah. He was called the Baqar, meaning the one that sheds. 
rips. Why? Because he was the one that shed knowledge, meaning he was the first from Ahlul Bayt that was able to disseminate their knowledge. So it's as if knowledge was placed somewhere untouched. He opened it, shed it, and disseminated it. This is where Al-Baqir comes. So this Christian man, he comes and he starts insulting the Imam, making fun of his name. This is something that angers us, right? So he told them, Anta al-Baqar, you're the cow. Now imagine someone tells me that. I start burning inside, right? Now maybe I can control myself, but I will still be angered. I'll be provoked. The hadith says the imam was not provoked at all. He was so cool, even inside. And he just quietly, coolfully answered him very calmly. He said, no, I'm not Baqar, I'm Baqar. That person knows that. But the imam, you know, knows how to answer. He told them, I'm not Baqar, I'm Baqar. So he was trying to provoke the imam. He saw the imam isn't provoked. And that's why I'll get, inshallah, in the treatment stage. One of the best ways to teach yourself to stay cool is when someone provokes you, their goal is to get you, you know, provoked. When they see you're not provoked, they're going to feel disappointed. So don't help them in their plan of provoking you. They want you to go mad. So when you go mad, You've made them happy. You've, you've successfully completed their plan, made their plan work. And I'll get to that. So the man wanted to provoke the imam. He called him a cow. He saw the imam was so calm. So he tried again. He started to swear at the imam's mother. This is something where now we go crazy. Someone, your mom, this, your mom, that. Oh, I want to be tough. And, I, and I'll go and even hit, get physical, right? When someone talks about my mom. And we'll get to that. This is not being tough. According to Ahlul Bayt, even when someone speaks against your mom or whatever, and, and you want to go and get physical, either you want to get uh, violent verbally or physically, this isn't being tough. In fact, this is a form of being a coward, and we'll get to this, inshallah. So he starts to swear at the uh, imam's mother, and he made fun of her job. He said, Anta ibn Tabbakha, your mother was a cook. Apparently, it was looked down upon in that society. So the imam also, he kept his cool. He told her my, that was her job. Probably the mother of Imam al-Baqir used to cook. So he very calmly said, that was her job. Nothing wrong with that. And then he started to curse his mother. Anta ibn al-Sawda al-Badi'a. Your mother was the black African, uh, like nigger, basically. Zanjiya is like when you call someone nigger, right? That's a big, big insult. Al-Badi'a, your mother was who? He started to swear at Imam al-Baqir's mother. The Imam kept to school. He said, "In kunta sadaqta, ghafar Allahu laha." If you're honest, what you said about my mother is true, then may Allah Subhanahu wa Taala forgive her. But if you're lying, may Allah forgive you. What a beautiful answer he kept to school. That man, when he saw, no, this man is truly has the highest levels of tolerance and forbearance. The hadith says, فَأَسْلَمَ النَّصْرَانِ This Christian man became a Muslim. And I'll get to that, how we can use forbearance to attract people to our faith, to flip people completely, 180 degrees. So the imam in this hadith, he had hilm. He did not even get angered. He did not even get provoked. That's not easy. This is one of the most difficult virtues to attain. Someone's provoking you, insulting you, but you keep your cool. Even inside, you don't feel anger. So this is forbearance. Now let's go to the harms of anger. What are the harms of anger? Number one, one of the most important and dangerous harms of anger is that it intoxicates your mind. When you become angry, you lose your mind. You can't think logically anymore. You know, there's a reason why mad being, you know, when someone is angry, they call him mad. And when someone loses his mind, they call him he's gone mad. He's lost his mind. Because when you're mad, you go mad. When you're angry, you go mad. You really can't think. It's like you're drunk. You can't use logic anymore. And this is what Imam Ali says in one hadith. You can read it in front of you. He says, He says, beware of anger. He says, because the beginning is madness. You turn crazy to a crazy individual. And the end is remorse. You're going to regret what you did and said when you were angry. This is what Imam Ali says. And then the Imam says, this is another hadith where the Imam has a continuation of this hadith. He says, فَإِن لَمْ يَنْدَمْ فَجُنُونُهُ مُسْتَحْكَمْ He says, when you're angry, 
you go mad. You become majnoon, crazy. That's why you, you regret later. He says, if you don't regret what you did when you were angry later, that means you're truly a madman. You, your madness is permanent. It's not just temporary because you were angry. No, you're truly a mad individual. So he's trying to say that we do crazy things when we are angry. And that's why you see many times we completely overreact over such silly things, small things that don't even deserve a reaction. Someone spills coffee, tea. My kid you know, flips the cup and the tea drops. It's not a big deal. It's such a small thing. If you think logically, you, you see it as such a trivial thing. But because you're enraged, you see it as if the entire world is being destroyed and you need to go crazy and yell and scream. It doesn't require such a reaction, but because you've lost your mind, this is what we do. We yell at small kids sometimes, one-year-old, two-year-old. Sometimes I do that. My young child's three years old. I expect better from him, but you forget that he's only a child. Allah hasn't given him the capacity to understand not to do this. We forget because of anger doesn't let us think logically. That's why we get yell at kids and we yell, we get mad at them and we yell at them even though it's not logical. Even worse, we sometimes yell at animals. You know, many times when before people used to have horses and camels, when the camel's going slow, they curse the camel, they curse the horse. He doesn't even understand, for God's sake. So if someone sees a human being cursing an animal, you look like an idiot because this animal doesn't even understand anything. But when you're angry, there's no logic anymore. And even worse, sometimes we yell at objects. Your phone isn't working. You start cursing your phone, which is not, it's not even a living thing. Isn't this stupid? Your anger lets you do crazy things. You've seen videos, people beating up their laptops. They're beating up their uh, TVs, right? Because it's not working the right way. Why do they do such illogical things? Because anger does that to them. We completely lose our mind. And we harm ourselves by doing that. That's why we regret later. That's why Imam Ali says the beginning is madness. The end is regret. If you want one beautiful sentence... Summarizing what anger is and what it does, the Imam says, junun, It starts with madness, it ends with regret. And if you don't regret, some people, they don't regret the stupid things they do or the harmful things they do when they were angry, the insult, then they truly are insane, the Imam says. Because if you're sane, you will regret all the name calling, all the yelling, all the screaming. If you got physical when you're angry, you will regret. If you don't regret, that means you're insane. So, what are the harms? So we said that it intoxicates your mind and leads to many harms. I've just listed some. You can probably think of much more harms. Number one, one of the most dangerous harms that anger leads to is committing crimes. Many times good people committed crimes because they lost their temper. That anger made them into a murderer. People who've never even probably crossed a traffic light before, they committed murder because they were so enraged at someone and they had a knife or a gun, they killed. I've seen so many videos. They have security in a store. Two people, you know, are, are discussing and something in the store. The one wants to buy it. The other isn't giving him um, the price. It escalates, escalates. One of them takes out a knife and he kills the other individual. I've seen tons of videos. I'm sure you've seen videos. You've heard stories. People get in a fight for the stupid, stupidest reasons. Because he cut in front of me. Because he took my parking spot. Something so irrelevant, so trivial. It escalates because when we are enraged, we don't think logically until one kills the other, right? This is what, um, this is what anger does to us. I've heard so many stories of, uh, you know, of murder happening because of, of this. I remember once my father told me a story of how two individuals, they owned gas stations right across the street. So one of them brought the price down. The other one, the other one went to him. And he, he threatened him, take it down. He felt enraged. You know, this person is bringing the price down. Now nobody's coming to me. Now it was also greed in addition to anger. The other one resisted. So what did he do? The guy that, was, had, that had the higher price, he came with his gun the next day and he shot and killed the other guy. Because his, his, his anger, this is what it did to him. And sometimes what's even worse is that some crimes are committed towards innocent people that are just Caught in the crosshairs. I'm angry at someone. I have a gun, a knife. I, someone tries to stop me. I kill this poor individual that's trying to stop me. 
Sometimes anger can lead you know, to you to killing so many people. And it's not just killing, it could lead you to hurting other people. Just recently, I was hearing the Middle East, there was a fight between a guy, uh, two individuals. And um, you know, this is what the rage of one of them did to him, that he wanted to seek revenge. He went with a bunch of his friends and they um, found the guy by himself, um, I think yesterday, somewhere. They uh, kidnapped him or they brought him to the floor and uh, they started beating him and then he cut both of his arms off. And then he cut his eyes, his eyes, he, he cut it out, both of them. The eyeballs, he completely, you know, cut them out of the socket because of the rage, that the, uh, their stupid fight over something irrelevant. I think they were fighting over a girl or something like that. And this is what Imam al-Sadiq alayhi salam says in one hadith. He says, وَكَانَ أَبِي يَقُولُ He says, my father Imam Baqir used to say, أَيُّ شَيْءٍ أَشَدْ مِنَ الْغَضَبِ he says, there's nothing crazier, more stronger than ghadab, than anger, more damaging, destructive than ghadab. Sometimes you're a very good person. You would never ever think about killing someone, but anger will make you contemplate killing. When you're so angry, you want, you want to seek revenge, you'll even think about killing someone. And I'm sure we've had some of these thoughts sometimes. When our fights get, you know, escalate so much, we even think about killing. Kill for, for such a, I mean, if you think about it logically, it doesn't make sense. We're fighting over something so stupid. I want to kill that person because of a parking spot, because he called me something, because he took my spot, because this, because that. So this is number one. Number two, anger, one of the harms is it damages relationships. When you're angry, remember, you lose your temper. You start swearing, you start insulting, you start hurting, you know, your spouse's feelings, your children, your neighbor, your brother, sister's friends. When you're angry, you say things that you don't really mean. You're the worst person I've ever seen in my life. The day that I married you till now, it's been all downhill. And it's not true. You've had good days. This happens a lot between married couples. They say certain, certain things that they don't mean, which are not true because they're under the influence of anger. It's like alcohol. But then they regret it later. Now the problem is, many times the damage that's done cannot be undone anymore. That's it, خلاص. She doesn't want me, he doesn't want her. You know, it could be a friend. You, you, you're very um, toxic in your speech. You hurt their feelings. They don't want to befriend you anymore. You can't go and tell them, well, I was angry. Sometimes we do it in front of other people. And, you know, that person felt very offended and disrespected. So the words cannot be taken back. That's why Imam Ali alayhi salam says in one hadith, A'da adu lilmar ghadabuh. Your number one enemy, your greatest enemy is your anger. Because anger can do to you what your biggest enemy could never do to you. You can destroy yourself. Remember crimes it could lead you to committing crimes. Number two, it could lead you to, uh, it could damage your relationships. And number three, it could damage your own self. The physical and mental health that anger does to you it's a way of, of you punishing your own self. So he provoked you. He insulted you. Now let me put, you know, as they say, add fuel to the fire. Let me pl place uh, salt on the, on the injury. When you're angry and you're, you're, you haven't experienced an outburst, you're only uh, punishing yourself. Because look at what happens to you physically. Your heart rate goes up. Your blood pr pressure goes up. Anxiety. And uh, you can even have a stroke. Some people, because they're so angered, they have a stroke. And the mental, the mental damage that it does to you, the mental, the stress that it gives you. Sometimes when you're very angry and you're yelling like at your kids for like 10 minutes, you're breathing like, you, it's as if someone beat you up. This is what anger does to you. And this is what Imam Ali alayhi salam says in one hadith. He says, Al-ghadab, narun muqada. Anger is a burning fire. He says, if you control it, you extinguish that fire. You put it out. He says, if you unleash it, I'm angry and I want to go yell and scream, right? He says, if you unleash it, you will be the first to be burned by it. So this is number three. And number four, it damages your reputation. When people see your, 
you're crazy yelling because someone cut in front of you, because the line is taking too long, because the fly is not boarding. You see people, they lose patience, they get angry. Nobody respects that person anymore. You could lose your job because of your anger. There's stories online. People lost their prominent jobs, their positions, their standing. Because to you, you're enraged. You weren't thinking about the repercussions and the ramifications of what you're doing. Sometimes you're even caught on video. I've seen so many videos, people at the airports, because they missed their flight, because they didn't put them on that, on that flight, because whatever, they go crazy, outburst. And people are video, videotape, videotaping them. You know, their reputation goes down their drink. And that's why Imam Ali said that your worst enemy is your anger. It could do all these four things to you. In one hadith, Imam al-Baqir he tells us that when you are in rage, the shaitan controls you. He's so happy. Do this, you do it. Yell, scream, hit, beat, get physical, take a knife. The shaitan controls you, the Imam says. He says, He says, anger is a burning sensation from the devil in the heart of a human being. It's the shaitan that places. He says, He says, subhanAllah, even your looks, you start looking like the shaitan. Right? When someone's angered, his eyes turn red when they're you know crazy, very, very angered. His veins start bulging out. He's scary. He's scary looking. And the devil enters his heart. And that's why there's a hadith that say, it's either a hadith or the ulama of akhlaq that say, just if you look at yourself in the mirror, how silly you look or how ugly you look when you're so angry and wild, you'll never be angry anymore. Just your looks are scary. And there's a hadith where the imam says that Iblis, the shaitan, he told Nuh one day, this is what, thousands of years ago. He told him, He gave him some tips. Three areas, I can easily strike the human being. So be careful in these three areas. And one of them, he said, He says, if you're angry, this is one of my ways to completely control the human being. It's so easy for the shaitan to control you when you're angry because you don't think logically anymore. So be careful when you're angry, this is, you're, you're asking the shaitan, you're helping him, inviting him to come and control you. Now, the other two, I did not write them, but uh, one of them, I remember the second one, the third, I don't remember. The second one, he says, anytime when you are with a person that's not your mahram, in a private place, sometimes, you know, even if it's a professional setting, the shaitan says, any man and woman who are not related, they are somewhere together, only them, I will be the third person. So with Kurni, anytime you are with another woman, it's just you, know that I will be there. I'm going to try my best for you to do haram. Remember, when you're angry, he tries his the best. And when there's uh, na-mahram, he tries his best. The third one, I don't remember. I can, I can look up the hadith, inshallah, next time. And number two, so th this is the harms of anger. Number one, we said it's complete, dam damages you, and we said four ways. Number two, one of the harms of anger is that when you lose your temper, it makes you look like you're at fault, even if you're the mazloom. Someone cuts in front of me in line, right? I'm, I've been wronged. He's the, he's the one that people should yell at. He's the one that people should look down upon. But then I have an outburst. I start yelling and screaming and insulting. I've been standing in line, you cut, right? All of a sudden, people will side with that person. I will waste my own cause. So when you're oppressed, you've been wronged, you're outraged, and you release that into an outburst, you're going to lose that battle. People will blame you now. So it's the worst, it's the best way for you to completely flip the outcome of being mazloom to dhalim. You see that many times. Sometimes really, I mean, uh, airlines, they really wrong you. You know, they put you off the plane or your bag is lost, but you lose your cool, you lose your temper, you start yelling, screaming, people will call you the crazy one. You're the stupid one. You're the um, oppressor here, you know. You're the one that's exceeding the, the line. It's not the airline. So these are some of the harms of danger, of uh, 
anger. Any questions? I, I think the third, oh, there's someone that wrote, I think the third is when you want to give sadaqah. I think so too, yes. Probably the third one is uh, when, when you want to donate for the cause of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he uses greed against us. I think that might be the third one. Here, let's go over the benefits of the opposite of anger, the opposite, the opposing virtue, which is forbearance, al-hilm or al-tahallum, either one. Number one, as we said, it turns enemies into friends, subhanAllah. When you're provoked, insulted by someone, and then instead of replying with, by yelling and screaming and insulting, which is what anger wants us to do, if you reply with kindness, the opposite of what your anger wants, that enemy, most of the time, will turn into a friend. And this is what the Quran says. The Quran says, اتفع بالتي هي أحسن فإذا الذي بينك وبينه عداوة كأنه ولي حميم. The Quran says, repel evil when someone provokes you, insults you, with what is best, al-ahsan. The Quran says, why? The Quran says, then the person that you have animosity with, there's animosity, hatred, that person will be as if he's a warm friend. And there's many, many stories from Ahlul Bayt. One that I mentioned, Imam al-Baqir with that Christian man, he called the Imam Kao, he that he started to insult his mother, the imam kept to school and he was nice, that Christian man became a Muslim. It's like, wow, this man has to be, you know, connected to Allah, that has this much patience and tolerance, forbearance. There's another famous story with Imam Hassan, alayhi salam. A man from Sham came to Medina, he saw Imam al Hassan. People in Sham were brainwashed. It's like someone that comes from Alabama, a white guy, and he sees Muslims, right? He has so many stereotypes against us, right? Because he watches Fox News. So he's brainwashed. He comes and he sees you're a, you're, you're a Muslim, you're wearing hijab, and he starts swearing, you Muslims are terrorists, you Muslims, right? Mm -hmm. What do we do? Usually because we're angered, we want to reply by yelling. So this man from Sham, he came and he started to swear at the Imam. And every bad word, every expletive, he knew he used it against the Imam. What did the Imam do? SubhanAllah. The hadith says the Imam started smiling and laughing. And that's why they say in one, of, one of the treatments of anger is to laugh. Try to laugh. Try to think of something funny to diffuse the anger. So the Imam used this. He laughed right away. And then he told him, SubhanAllah, he kept his cool. The Imam was not angered. Remember, this is ilm. When you're not even provoked. Because the Imam knew this guy's brainwashed. You know, if I see a white guy that comes, I'm not even going to get angry because of this. I'll feel pity for him. Because this person is brainwashed by the right-wing media. So the Imam, this is how he saw him. He laughed and he told him, He says, it looks like you're a stranger. It looks like you're a stranger, you're not from Medina. And I think you have the wrong guy. Imagine someone, he comes all, the, all of a sudden, he comes up to you and he starts swearing at you. You keep your cool and you tell him, I think you have the wrong individual. That requires a lot of patience and forbearance. Hilm. The Imam knew he met him, but he's trying to diffuse the situation. He's trying to, you know, make him relax. And then the Imam started to speak with him in such a nice way. He told him, The Imam told him, anything you need, I will give you. If you're hungry, I'll feed you. If you need money, don't go anywhere else. I'll give you money if you need shelter, if you need help, if you need guidance, if you need, if you need. Imagine you swear at someone and he speaks to you in such a kind way. The Imam completely diffused all that hatred. The Imam could have yelled back, but it would have served no purpose. You know what happened? The man started crying. The man from Sham started crying because he always heard from Muawiyah and the government, the propaganda of Bani Umayyah, that Ahlul Bayt are not good people. Right? When he saw this man is an angel, he's a saint. This is how he treats his enemies. How will he treat his friends? He started crying and he told himself, I'm so ashamed of myself. I wish the earth would swallow me. That was so 
shameful, such a shameful act for me. And then he told him, Ashhadu annaka khalifatullah fi Allah. I bear witness that you are the representative of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, not Muawiyah. That was all propaganda. And then he told the Imam al-Hassan, and this is what we speak about, this is the point that I'm looking for. He told him, before this incident, I hated you and your father, Ali ibn Abi Talib, more than anyone in the world. Now, after what you did, I love you and your father more than anyone. See, one act where you, you're provoked, instead of releasing your anger, you show forbearance and kindness, you turn an enemy into a friend, and he became a follower of Ahlul Bayt, alayhim it makes enemies into friends. So this is one of the benefits of hilm, forbearance. Instead of escalating and the animosity continues, you turn that enemy into a friend with forbearance. Number two, one of the benefits of hilm, naam. Now, like you said, you may not always receive the same, expect the same result as Imam al-Hassan. You can still show kindness to some and they will still, they will still oppress you. Now, as they say, you know, there's even an Arabic um, poetry, when anta akramta al-kareem malaktahu. If you show kindness to a good person, then that person will love you. When anta akramta al-la'im tamarada. Sometimes when someone is so evil, showing them kindness will just lead them to doing more evil. Such individuals, now you should still give it a shot, but if you see it that it's making it worse, kindness, maybe you should stop, just pull away and ignore him. So look, the point is don't release your anger. Either ignore in situations where kindness will not be helpful. If it is helpful, give it a try at least once. You won't lose anything. You try, it fail, just ignore and turn your way and go to another direction. So Sayyidina, maybe your reward is you. Of course, Taban. The reward is there, and I'll get to this. This is number three. The reward will always be there, whether that person accepted your kindness or rejected. Patience, being tolerant. This is high amount of reward, great reward. Doesn't matter what happens, as long as you were patient and you were tolerant and you showed forbearance. Hell, your Allah will give you the reward. Doesn't matter if that person, um, if that person, you know, accepted or not. That has nothing to do with it. Yes, so, so number one is forbearance turns an enemy into a friend. Number two is that helm, forbearance, is the best way to defeat someone that's trying to provoke you. And I spoke about this. I alluded to it. Because when someone comes and he insults you, what does he want? He wants you to, uh, to rage, right? He wants to frustrate you, irritate you. He loves it when you start yelling back and screaming. This is what he wants. That's his plan. So the best way to destroy his plan is to keep calm, cool you're gonna rage enrage him now I'm, I'm i'm swearing at you and your mother and your family you're still ignoring me you're not you're smiling in my face you're gonna truly make that person go mad so by letting into your anger and releasing it you're giving him what he wants and he's your enemy why do that isn't that stupid but anger lets us do stupid things logic tells you ignore him because if you don't you're falling into his trap he wants you to Go crazy and yell and scream, make you look like an idiot. So the best thing is to disappoint him by staying calm. So hilm, forbearance, is the best way to defeat your enemy when he's trying to provoke you. And there's a story that happened during the time of Amir al-Mu'mineen. Jabir ibn Abdullah, the companion, he narrates it. He says, you can see it. He says, Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi salam heard one day someone was insulting and swearing at Qambar. Qambar was the servant of Imam Ali. He was just swearing and insulting Qambar. Qambar wanted to reply. The Imam quickly came, he interfered. He told him, Mahlan ya Qambar, wait Qambar. Control your anger. Don't release it. Da' shatimaka muhanan. Turdi rahman wa tusqit shaytan wa tu'aqib aduwak. He says, ignore him. Because if you do this, you will please Allah first by controlling your anger. You will... You will anger the shaitan because remember the shaitan wants you to go crazy because you, you could commit haram, you could start yelling, screaming, commit so many sins and crimes. So you'll please Allah, anger the shaitan and you will punish the enemy that's trying to provoke you because he wants you to reply. When you ignore him, you're punishing him. And then the imam said, 
جن وبراء أو الحب وبراء النسمة ما أرضى المؤمن ربه بمثل الحل The Imam said I swear by Allah that one of the best ways to please Allah is by teaching yourself to be for you know to, to have forbearance to be patient to control your anger حل ولا أسخط الشيطان بمثل الصمت The best way to anger shaytan and fight him صمت Stay quiet Don't proceed with your anger Don't release it the best way to punish the ahmaq, the fool that wants to provoke you, is to ignore him. Because if you want to go and you want to show that you're tough, you're just giving him what he wants. This is number two. And number three, one of the benefits of forbearance is that God will protect you from his wrath on the day of judgment. Remember, when you're angry, right, and you can punish someone, you can destroy them. Someone insults you, you can go and beat them up. Or your children, they anger you. The Imam says, when you know that you can overpower someone and you're angry at them, remember that on the day of judgment, Allah will be angry at you because we commit sins, right? No one is infallible. I commit sins, Allah will be angry. And Allah is much more powerful. If you want Allah to forgive you on the day of judgment, you forgive other individuals when you're angry. Control your anger and Allah will prevent you from his wrath and anger. You want to be tough and you want to show your anger, Allah is going to do the same thing with you. Allah, you're nothing in front of Allah on the day of judgment. He says, you committed this, 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 this thing. And when you were angry and you have angered me, and when you were angry in the dunya, you always released it. You used to go and beat up other people, right? You used to release the anger in the worst ways. I will release my anger upon you today. So you want to be saved from Allah's wrath on the day of judgment, then you save other people from your wrath. That's why there's a hadith from Imam al-Baqir where he says, or a hadith from Rasulullah actually, the Prophet says, Allah told his Prophet Dawood, he revealed to him, he says, if my abd, my servant, remembers me when he's in rage, when he's angry, I will remember him on the day of judgment when I'm angry. And I will not punish him. And Imam al-Baqir salam says, Man kadama ghaydan wa huwa yaqdiru ala imza'ih, hasha Allah ta'ala qalbahu amnan wa imanan yawm al qiyam Whoever controls his anger, and he was able to release his anger in a satisfying way, Allah will make sure that he is safe on the day of judgment. So how do I know if I'm an angry person? Now, many times it's obvious because anger is, is, is difficult to tame. It's difficult to hide. So many times you will know if you're an angry person, if you're hot-headed, as they say. But sometimes we need the signs. We need the symptoms. So let's mention some of the symptoms. Number one, if you, and this is an obvious symptom. If you get violent, if you have a tendency to get violent, you take a bottle of water and throw it. Right, you, whatever is in your hand, you throw it. Then that means you have anger issues. You have this vice of anger. It's become a vice, and you can't control yourself. Number two, if others are afraid of you when you're angry, I know some people, especially the father in the house, when he gets angry, the children run away. That means you're too hot-headed. Cool down. If your kids run away, if your wife runs away from you, this is you know. Mentioning the common example, it could be the other way around. It could be the husband running away from the wrath, wrath of his wife. But either way, the point is, if your family members run away from you when you're angry and yelling, that means you have anger issues. You're too hot-headed. So this is number two. Number three, if you're constantly, if you constantly feel irritated with people, you easily get irritated. I'm doing this and someone is raging. He has anger issues because maybe it's annoying, but you shouldn't be, you know, shouldn't lose your temper to that level. That's why they say, you know, if someone annoys you, then probably that person is annoying. But if everyone annoys you, then you're the annoying person, right? If everybody's a jerk, that can't be, then probably you are the jerk. Maybe one guy's a jerk, he cut you off. On it. But if every person you meet, oh, this guy's a jerk, this guy's this, this guy, you're the jerk. You're the person that has no, you can't control your temper, so you have to be careful. So you have a feeling of, if you feel victimized always, right? Every, it's always, it was her fault, it was his fault. You're always blaming other people. This could mean that you have anger issues. You have to settle those anger issues, cool down. 
And that's why many times angry people, they see their anger is justified. When they yell a road rage, it's justified. He was trying to, you know, cut me off and he wanted me to crash. When, you know, the line is going too slow, the cash register, yeah, they're doing it on purpose or they're stupid or, or whatever, right? When the doctor isn't taking you in, probably he's sitting on his phone and playing. You, you start assume so many negative things, right? So when you see your anger is justified, you're blaming other people, that could mean that you have anger issues. Number four, if you cannot forgive someone that insulted you, that wronged you, that could mean you have anger issues because your anger prevents, every time you remember, you start raging. Your anger prevents you from moving on and forgiving that person. So if you have that problem that you can't forgive people, it could mean you have anger issues. Number five, this is similar to number two. If people are afraid to come and talk to you and open up certain topics, then that means you could be, have anger issues because there's going to be an argument and you're going to start yelling and screaming and you can get physical. Some people, you can't even talk to them, right? As soon as you open a discussion with them, they go crazy. Anger issues. So if you notice there are some topics that people cannot open with you, right? Or some individuals that don't dare and come and even speak to you, that means you're an angry individual. Number six, if your relationships and friendships don't last, you keep on getting married and get divorced. You know, most people in your family don't like being around you. You don't have too many friends or you make friends and lose them. It could be that you have anger issues because anger repels. People hate angry individuals. They're getting angry and yelling all the time. People hate that. They don't want to be around angry people. Number seven. Number seven, number eight, they're more indirect they're not easy to always find and that's why they call them passive aggressive behavior passive aggressive behavior behavior is when you have deep anger that you indirectly express you're smiling you could either be you can even be laughing but there's anger inside you they call this passive aggressive behavior it's more difficult to spot and i've read you know on psych psychology websites that sometimes we ourselves we have this issue of passive aggressive behavior and we don't even know it so What's one example? Number seven, you rely on sulking. Just always, you know, bad mood. And rely on the silent treatment, ignoring others to get your point across. You know, you're so, sometimes you're, you're raging, but you're not screaming. But you what? You're completely ignoring someone. Or your face is such, you know, you're, you're frowning at that person. So there is no rage here, expression, but there is, Anger inside. So if you find yourself, you always use the silent treatment, as they say, always ignoring people, always sulking at them. This could mean that you have anger issues. Maybe you've realized that an outburst is useless. It makes you look like an idiot. It's harmful. So you express it through peaceful ways. That doesn't mean that you're, you don't have anger issues. You can still have anger issues, but you show them in other ways. And number eight, this is what I saw some, you know, scientific medical websites, they say if you're always using, if you're always sarcastic, yeah, you're always, you know, mocking other people in a sarcastic way, you have anger that you don't want to unleash directly, you say in a sarcastic way. You're trying to point out flaws in other people, but you do it in a sarcastic way, indirect way. So this, if I use sarcastic methods a lot, sarcastic language too much, it could mean that I have too much anger inside me. So now that we understand the diagnosis, let's go to the last level, the treatment level. And the most difficult, brothers and sisters, vice to get rid of is probably anger because it just, it's just so powerful and controls you. Temper, you know, our temper is ingrained in us. It's strongly molded onto our personalities. And it's if you're an angry person, you have that personality it's not easy to practice forbearance it's not easy to cool off and calm down that's why the holy prophet is narrated saying halim an yakun the halim the one that does not show anger this person is is you know is, is like a prophet only prophets can do that so if you know good to you if you are able to achieve al halim forbearance because this is a quality that usually only only prophets have so difficult for people it's difficult, but it's possible. Be careful, brothers and sisters. Pay attention to this. It's not impossible. Some people say, you know what? I have a bad temper. I'm hot-headed. That's it. No, that's not it. You can change 
that temper of yours. And Imam Sadiq alayhi salam, he shows us this. He says, مَا مِنْ جُرْعَ يَتَجَرَّعُهَا الْعَبْدَ أَحَبْ إِلَى اللَّهِ عَزَّ وَجَلْ مِنْ جُرْعَةِ غَيْضَ يَتَجَرَّعُهَا عِنْدَ تَرَدُّدِهَا فِي قَلْبِهِ إِمَّا بِصَبْرٍ وَإِمَّا بِحِلْ The Imam says, amongst the most difficult acts that Allah loves, it's difficult and Allah loves, is to prevent yourself from an outburst when you're angry, to control your anger. How do you do it, the Imam says? Either through patience or through forbearance. Either through sabr or through hilm. When do you need sabr? When you're angered and you can't do anything about it, right? When the government angers you, you can't do anything about it. You can't seek revenge. So what do you need here? You need patience. Be patient. Allah, inshallah, will give me much more in the akhirah. So anytime you're provoked, you're angered, you need one of two, patience or hilm. Or forbearance. If you can't do anything about it, you need patience. How do we develop patience? We spoke about that last week. If you can do something about it, like your kid, your kid enrages you, right? It makes you go crazy. You're enraged. You can destroy your kid. Here, you don't need just patience. You need helm. You need forbearance. You need uh, restraint. You need tolerance. Exactly, big dose. That's why Allah says, the Imam says, Allah loves that and it's difficult. It's not easy. So how do we develop al-hilm? Now remember we said there's two levels. The first is when you don't even get angry. That's the highest level. And the second is when you get angry, but you control it. So let's begin with the first. How can I teach myself to not get angry? And remember, this is super, super difficult. It may take you five years. If you start today on this quest, five years till you achieve it. It may take you a year. It's very difficult because we said anger, our, our temper is ingrained in us. It's difficult to change it, but it's possible. It's possible. Hmm? Exactly. Some people say it's not worth it. It is worth it. Look at the harms that we spoke about of anger. So I'll mention five, five steps here on how, how to teach ourselves to not even get angry. Now, we can't completely stop it, but we can limit it. Number one, remind yourself that if there is injustice towards you, there's a reward on the day of justice. It's not the end of the world. Someone, you know, stole money from me. I'm angry. Allah will give you a billion times more in, in, on the day of judgment. Why fret about it? And we spoke about this in patience also. How to develop patience. Remember, there's a next life. Allah will reward you. You know, why do we get angry many times? Because there's a feeling of indignation. I feel like it's unfair. This is unfair treatment. And this happens many times between spouses, husband and wife. My wife isn't fair with me. She's spending too much time with her friends, not with me. My husband doesn't care about me. Work, 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 and his friends, and his sahra, and whatever. And he's neglecting me. He's not caring about me. He hurts my feelings, right? We get angry because I feel like he's unfair. How do to prevent yourself from getting angry with your spouse? As an example, remember, you're not losing anything. Allah is watching and he'll reimburse you. Anything that your husband doesn't do for you, any lulum, any negligence, Allah will reward you a million times more on the day of judgment. And listen to this hadith from the Holy Prophet. The Prophet says, Man sabara ala su'i khuluq imra'atihi. Sometimes my wife has such a bad temper that I can't, I, I'm enraged. I can't even live with her anymore. That's why I'm always fighting with her. I'm always angry. The Prophet says, Man sabara ala su'i khuluq imra'atihi. If you have patience, wahtasabahu, say Allah will take care of it. A'taahu Allah bi kulli yawm wa layla yasbir alayha min al-thawab ma a'ta ayyub ala bala'i. Allah will give you for each day the thawab of what he gave Prophet Ayyub. Prophet Ayyub is the example of patience where all the you know, difficulties of life, they all piled up upon him, but he was still patient. And the hadith tells us that Ayyub's patience was unbelievable. Allah will give him a great amount of reward for his patience. If you're able to you know, swallow it, accept it. My wife is terrible. Ya Allah, you're seeing what she's doing to me. Allah will give you the thawab of Ayyub. So you should be happy. That what she's doing, Allah has, will reimburse you so much. And likewise, the Prophet says, وَمَنْ صَبَرَتْ عَلَى سُوءْ خُلُقْ زَوْجِهَا أَعْطَاهَا مِثْلِ ثَوَابْ آسِيَ بِنْتْ مُزَاحِمْ And whoever, a female, whoever has patience with her, the temper of her husband, bad tempered, Allah will give her for each day the thawab of Asiya bint Muzahim, the wife of Fir'aun. That Allah mentions her in the Holy Quran and glorifies her and she's amongst the greatest women Allah has given her. Allah has created. So remember that 
when you, you feel that life is unfair, your spouse is unfair with you and you want to get angry, don't. Allah will give you a million times more. You're not losing anything. If you teach yourself that, when someone is treating you unfairly, you're not losing anything, you're gaining. Not only will you be able to control your anger, you won't even be angry anymore. So this is number one. Number two, and this I mentioned something similar about patience. Why do we get angry? Think about it. We set goals. We don't meet that goal, right? Then we think it's at the end of the world. I wanted to, for example, be at this place at that time. This guy is going so slow. I won't be there at 8. I'll be there at 8.01. I start raging and honking the horn. I start yelling and screaming and I give him the middle thing. Why? Because I lost that one minute. So what? So teach yourself. Any goal that you set, if you didn't meet it, who cares? It's not the end of the world. It's not worth me losing my temper over. And this, we can use it with our kids. You mentioned this, sister. You know, most of the times, we make a big deal out of something stupid. Who cares? I wanted the house to be clean. Let it be messy. So what? Does the Quran say your house has to be clean 24 hours? Let them give them once a week. Let them spill everything all, everywhere. There's a stain in the carpet. Who cares? They broke something. It's not a big deal. Teach yourself. Nothing is a big deal. This is a dunya. It's supposed to be a mess. In the Jannah, inshallah, everything will be ordered. Life is supposed to be a mess. So don't make a big deal if your child breaks something, if they don't do something, if they make a big mess, right? Tell yourself your health is more important. When you're screaming and yelling the whole day, you're destroying your own self. Whatever they broke, it could be replaced, inshallah. Your health cannot be replaced. So the harm of yelling sometimes and being angry is greater and worse than not achieving that goal, whatever that goal was, right? Or whatever time, well, now I have to sit an hour and clean after my kids. The harm of that cleaning is less than what you're doing, the bad example that you're setting, you're, 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 you're you know, scaring your kids and you're destroying your own health. So remember, if it doesn't happen, this is what I teach myself with my kids. They broke something, who cares? I'll replace it. I won't even replace it. Before, you know, I used to go, man, let, let them break a bowl. Let them, who cares? What's the worth of this bowl that I, you know, I, 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 I damage my health over a piece of, over, over a, you know, bowl? It's not worth it over a plate, over a TV. Yeah, now TV, you could buy one for $200. Yani it's, not something, it's not the end of the world. So teach yourself that whatever happens, it's not a big deal. Number three, you have to learn to be empathetic. Learn empathy. Why? Because many times someone cuts you off, right? We assume this person did it intentionally, were enraged. Maybe they never saw me. Right? Assume the best in people. Maybe they never saw me. Maybe they didn't. Someone came and sat in my seat and I'm enraged. Maybe they didn't know it was my seat. Give people the benefit of the doubt. We're angered because we always assuming the worst in people. Assume the best in people. Your spouse came late. Oh, he was probably in a sahra. No, maybe, you know, maybe it was a tough day. Something happened. Something bad. Maybe they had an excuse. If you teach yourself, husnavan, this is called. Husnullah, one of the qualities of a Muslim, you always give people the benefit of the doubt. You assume the best in people. Not only is this good for other people, it's good for you. You're always going to be calm. Yeah, maybe he had something important. I don't come to class one day. Maybe I was caught in traffic. Oh, versus he, he made us come to class and you're enraged, right? You think it's intentional. If they call you and tell you he was in a car accident, your rage and your anger is going to go away and it's going to turn into awe. Oh, you know, you, it's going to turn into pity and you're going to feel bad and sorrow. So always assume that that person had an excuse. This is number three. Number four, teach yourself, this is tough, to be a little thick skin. Sometimes we're very thin skin. Someone criticizes me, I get angry. Someone calls me something, I get angry. Someone insults me, I get angry. Teach yourself to be a little thick skin. He criticized me, so what? He insulted me, who cares what he thinks? Who is he? He's not an imam. He's not my dad. He's not someone too important in my life. In the street, someone calls me a name. Who cares? Why should that, why should that even be you know, a reason why I go crazy? Who cares about this person? And there's a hadith from the Prophet where he tells Abu Dhar, listen to this. If you use this, you can use this hadith so many times in your life. The Prophet says, Ya Abu Dhar, لا يفقه الرجل كل الفقه he says, the Prophet tells Abu Dhar, you will not reach the essence of wisdom. You won't be a truly wise individual 
knowledgeable individual until you see everyone next to Allah as camels. And who cares about people? The, we use this where sometimes we do haram acts to please people, we forget about Allah, right? We use this, you know, who's this? Think about Allah, Allah is the only important person. We can use this with anger. Someone comes and insults me. Imagine this person is a cat. Don't tell him, yani just in your heart. Are you going to be, you going to feel insulted? Who is he? So what? I don't care who this person is. Why should I feel insulted? He's not important. And then the Prophet says, so you don't get arrogant. Everyone's a camel and I'm... ثُمَّ يَرْجِعْ إِلَىٰ نَفْسِهِ فَيَكُونْ هُوَ أَحْقَرْ حَقَرْ لَهَا And then you look at yourself and you see yourself as even lower than others. So you don't become arrogant. So if others wrong you, brothers and sisters, who's that person? Just a camel. Who cares? He's nobody. Remember the story of Imam al-Baqir and when the guy called him a cow? And Imam al-Baqir, so what? It's just some random guy calling me a cow. What did I lose? What happened? Nothing. When someone worthless called me a cow, someone let him come and call me any name. It does not matter. Now, if that person's criticism is true, someone tells me, you know, you've been misbehaving. If, and, and that person is right here. We go back to the second part of the hadith of the imam. The imam says, be humble. So accept. Sometimes we have to learn to accept the criticism of others. So basically, the imam, the prophet is telling Abu Dhar says, if someone criticizes you and that person is wrong, like the guy that called Imam Baqir Kao, who cares? He's a worthless person. He's lying. But if he's right, then what? Then you should be humble and accept. Don't be arrogant. Part of being humble is to accept other people's criticism. That's why Imam al-Baqarah told him, "In kunta sadaqta ghafar Allah la." If you're if you're honest, my mother was this and that. May Allah forgive her. See, this is humility from the Imam. Some people, even if his mother is the worst mother, he'll say, "No, no." If she was really evil, may Allah forgive her. But if you're lying, may Allah forgive you. So number four, be thick-skinned. How? Whoever insults you doesn't matter. This is, I think we can use this with, with insults, anger in the face of insults. Who is this person? And if, if, if that person's criticism, not insults, not at the level of insult, is true, then maybe we should change. And finally, number five, stay away from people or discussions that provoke you. Triggers, remember? There's people, every time I sit with them, we fight, anger. Don't sit with that. Don't discuss certain things. For example, I gave this example, I think, before. When I sit with my wife, I start t talking about my in-laws. Every time I mention her mother or father or she mentions my parents, we fight. Khalas, make a rule. We don't mention the in-laws anymore. Because every time we mention our in-laws, we start fighting. So you want to prevent anger in your life? Don't talk about the, the, the things that make you angry. Say this topic, my in-laws, never will I talk about them. Now, it, maybe it's not good because it's a form of, but it's better than getting angry and yelling. Sometimes when you get angry, you start cursing your in-laws because your wife or your husband makes you angry. You don't mean it, right? Maybe they're good people, but you just want to hurt her feelings then. So your father is this, your mother is this, and we use very, very you know, nasty and, and uh, inappropriate words. So this is what, this is number one, how to prevent ourselves from getting angry. Number two, and we'll end with this number two, how to control anger. Now I'm angry. I couldn't. These five tips, they didn't work. I'm still angry when someone called me a cow. What do I do? Now you need to learn a tahallum, kazm al -ghayt. You need to learn how to control your temper. Fine, you're burning inside, just don't release. How? How do I do it? Amir al-Mu'minin says it's possible. It's possible to learn a tahallum and eventually do tahallum, which is, you know, restrain yourself. And that will eventually lead you to al-hilm. He says, in lam takun haliman, if you don't, if you can't not get angry, fatahallam. At least pretend like, pretend like, you know, you're cool. فَإِنَّهُ قَلَّ مَنْ تَشَبَّهَ بِقَوْمٍ إِلَّا أُشَكَ أَنْ يَكُنْ مَعْهُ Because when you pretend to be like someone, eventually you're going to become like him. If you pretend for an entire year that you are a crazy person, you're going to, in fact, be a crazy person. So if you pretend for an entire year that you're calm, eventually you're going to become calm because your nafs learns as you teach it. It's an exercise. So what are the ways? I have a few ways. Number one, how to control our anger. Remind yourself when you're angry that when you're angry at someone, you want to seek revenge. Remember, 
that if you leave it up to God, Allah will seek revenge for you in a much better way. So why put it in your hands? When he can seek revenge for you in a much better way. When you're angry at someone, they bother you, they treated you unfairly, unjust. No, Allah will seek revenge for you much better than you can. And this is mentioned in the hadith of Imam al-Sadiq, where the Imam says that Allah told one of his anbiya, he told one of his prophets, Ibn Adam, اذكرني عند غضبك, اذكرك عند غضبي. If you're angry, remember, if you're angry and you remember me, I will remember you when you're angry. And then Allah says, وإذا ظلمت أو ظلمت بمظلمة فرض بانتصاري لك فإن انتصاري لك خير من انتصارك لنفسك. And then Allah tells us, and if you were مظلوم, oppressed, wronged, accept my revenge for you since it is better than your revenge for yourself. What are you going to do? You're going to go yell and scream and slap? Allah will take care of that person by punishing it on the fires of hell if he really wronged you. But if you go and you try to retaliate, خلص, Allah won't fight for you anymore. Leave Allah to fight for you. That's why the Imams would not fight for themselves. They have Allah fighting for them, either in the dunya, if not in the akhirah. That's number one. Number two, and this is what I spoke about. Some people, why, when they're provoked, when someone swears at me or insults my mother, why do they reply? No, because they think it is a form of strength to reply. They're tough. If I'm a coward, someone yells at me, insults me, I'm going to look. No, this is wrong. Ahlul Bayt tell us it's exactly the opposite. It's not a weakness if someone insults you and you just turn your face. But unfortunately, in our society, if you do that, people will look at it as a weakness. Who cares about people? Do what Allah tells you is right. Controlling your temper is a form of strength. Wallahi, if, if you're able to control your temper, that's, that's, that's the tough one. It's easy just to yell back and scream back. That You chose the easy solution. The hard solution is to control yourself. And that's why the Holy Prophet said this in the hadith. He says, Laysa shadid The strong one isn't the one that can wrestle. That's not the tough guy. The truly tough one is the one that can control his anger. So remind yourself when you're strong, don't think that if you if you if, if you start yelling and screaming and show your anger, you're tough, you're a coward. Because the Prophet says the true one is the one that can tame his beast. If you can't tame this beast of anger, it means you're a coward, you have no strength. This is number two. Number three. And we mentioned this, so I'll quickly mention this again. When you're angry and you want to go and, you know, release that anger, especially with weak people like your kids or your spouse, remember the wrath of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Rasulullah tells Amir al-Mu'mineen, Ya Ali, la taghdab. First of all, la taghdab. This is number one, we said. فَإِذَا غَضَبْتْ If you weren't able and you got angry, فَقْعُدْ وَتَفَكَّرْ فِي قُدْرَةِ الرَّبْعَ عَلَى الْعِبَادِ وَحِلْمِهِ عَنْهُمْ don't get angry, but if you did get angry, remember Allah's power on the day of judgment over you and his tolerance and forgiveness. Don't you want Allah to be tolerant and forgive, forgive, forgiving with you? Then you show the same thing with others. So when your child did something wrong, you want to go beat him up? Remember Allah also can beat you up on the day of judgment. If you want to live by the law of the jungle that the strong destroys the weak, Allah can destroy you too. So This is number three. Number four. Remember that when you show, release your anger through an outburst, there is absolutely no gain in it. You only lose. So why proceed? So if, for example, you're so angry why this guy cut or why the doctor is keeping and you experience an outbreak, uh, an outburst, know that there is absolutely no gain in it. What are you going to gain? They're not going to let you in faster. You're not going to reach any conclusion or any outcome. You're only going to lose. You, your reputation goes down the drain. You start hurting yourself. You can hurt others, right? So if you have two options, number one is to vent, vent out, right? Release the anger. Feel good now. What do you get? Yes, you have the satisfaction of releasing anger. It feels good, but it's temporary. That's why after it is nadam, the imam said. After that, you're going to feel regret. You feel terrible later. So be patient now. Bear the pain of being patient. Controlling your anger, it's much better. You'll be so much happier later on. That's why they say most times when you're angry, you don't know what to do, right? What am I going to do? My wife is going to come. I'm so angry at her. The best thing is to do nothing for now. Because whatever you do, when you're under the influence of anger, it's going to be wrong. Whatever you do, if you have 20 options, they're all bad. 
because you're angry now. Cool down, then see, you can sit down and sort it out. So the best thing when you're angry is do nothing. It's the safest thing. Anything else, it's worse. This is number four. Number five. When someone's trying to provoke you, and we mentioned this, so once again, real quick, know that by letting into their anger, you're giving them what they want. So the best way to disappoint them is by staying calm. So when I'm angry at someone that provoked me, know that if you yell back at them and swear, you're just going to give them what they want. So just, just destroy that cycle by keeping calm. This is number five. Number six, if you saw yourself, you're, you're, you know, your anger is too strong, you're afraid you might hurt someone, quickly move back, get away, go somewhere else. If you're a child, you know, you're afraid you're going to hit them, quickly go into another room and lock the door on yourself because this is the shaitan controlling you now. So prevent yourself from access to that person that you're afraid about. And even if it looks uh, sometimes awkward, you're, there's family members, you, you just it's much better to look awkward than to do something stupid and yell and scream and everybody hating you. This is number six. Number seven, and this I think we went over it, so I'll mention it again. When you're angry, don't make a decision. Some people, they're angry, they have their phone. Who am I going to call? What am I going to do? They're don't make any decision when you're angry. So many people, they... You know, they, they end their relationships with some family members or friends. When they're angry, they regret it later. Wait, cool off, think about it logically, then make a decision. Don't quit your job when you're angry, right? Don't tell your wife, I hate you and I want to divorce you when you're angry. Don't make any decision because whatever decision you make under the influence of anger, it's going to be the wrong decision. Number eight, this is what psychologists say. Take many deep breaths. You can read about it online like at least 10, 15, this cools you off. The anger will be less. Number nine, this is what the imams tell us. Change your position. You see your anger is controlling you. Change your position. For example, I'm sitting. The imam says, stand up. The imam says, If you're standing, sit down. The shaitan will go away. If you're standing... If you're standing, sit down. If you're sitting, stand up, lie, lie down. Change your position because that will try to, you know, it will try to keep the anger away from you. And finally, number 10, we'll end with this. This is what the imams say. Now, I don't know the sci scientific reasoning behind this, but the imams say, if you get angry with a relative, like your brother, your sister, your father, your son, a relative, yeah. Rahim, touch them. If you're afraid that it's escalating, go and just touch them. That's a mahram, of course. Touch that individual. The imam says your anger level will go down. The imam, this is Imam al-Baqir, he says, You're angry towards a family member. Go to him. Go and touch them. So these are some ways that we can use to diffuse that anger, inshallah. Remember, it's going to be tough. But teach yourself this. Maybe write them down, remember them. So that, first of all, you don't get angry next time so easily. And if you do, know how to control your anger. Thank you so much, brothers and sisters. هذا وآخر دعوانا أن الحمد لله رب العالمين صلى الله على محمد وآله الطاهرين